Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to start the program. I wanted to welcome all to welcome you all to this this great space, 3S Art Space. Um, my name is George Regan. I'm with New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority, and um, we're pleased to um, have Cole Peterson here tonight. He, along with Cheryl Young from Trulia, will be uh, our featured speakers at our Thursday, October 4th Housing and Economy Conference. It'll be held in Manchester. Um, so we thought since Cole was going to be at that, and there's been such talk about accessory dwelling units, um, obviously for many of you may know there's a state law that went into effect in 2017. We've been talking about this as an innovative land use technique for a long, long time. Um, and so it's great to have someone who has been out there and has his own experience of building one and turning that, that experience into a knowledge base that's really helpful as we think about it for ourselves, for our communities. Um, just a bit about New Hampshire housing. Um, we're sort of the state's housing agency. Um, so we do that through a few programs. Uh, we try to help uh, renters afford their rent through our uh, Housing Choice Voucher Program. Um, a lot of us are trying to move into home ownership and so f fulfill that, that dream of home ownership. And we have programs geared towards all sorts of buyers, but especially first time buyers, um, to try to get them in um, to successful home ownership. We also help to promote uh, and finance low income housing tax credit projects. Um, which essentially, uh, Court Street is one in Portsmouth that's been in the news. That's one of the recent ones. If you're from the Dover area, Woodbury Commons, uh, or I'm sorry, Bradley Commons and Woodbury Mill are another example of some much needed rental housing in an area that's a great place to live and it increases demand for housing, both for purchase and for rent. Um, I'm in the Policy Planning and Communications Division. One of the things that we try to do is gather data, be a resource to communities, to, um, to folks that are concerned about housing, help them make the connection of housing and economic development. So I'm going to sort of say, if you haven't seen us on the way in, we created an accessory dwelling unit guide for homeowners. Um, and this is really great, and, and it really kind of underscores many of the things that Cole will be talking about tonight. So if you're thinking about that, um, this is a great book to help you think about some of the things that Cole's going to talk about. And of course, Cole's book is on sale tonight for, for a very discounted rate of $10. Um, so certainly, um, tonight's a night to try to get that. Um, so I just wanted to let you know a bit about what we're doing. We help, um, again, being a resource, we help to fund regional workforce housing coalitions, try to bring great speakers like Cole to, to the state. Um, and also programs like our Municipal Technical Assistance Grant Program that's funded through, that's run through Plan New Hampshire to help communities look at um, how to make more housing available in a way that works for their community. So that's a, a bit about us. I am now, um, again, very happy to have PS21 and the Workforce Housing Coalition that really helped to get the word out. And I'm so, I'm so glad there's so many people here. So I wanted to introduce Effie May from the PS21 who will talk to you a little bit about their organization. Welcome, <coughs> welcome, and thank you for coming tonight. To introduce myself, I'm Effie Malley, and I'm the treasurer for PS21. And to introduce Portsmouth Smart Growth, or PS21, we are an independent, volunteer-run nonprofit with the goal of supporting a vibrant, sustainable, livable, and walkable community. You can find out more, watch videos of past events, and make donations at www.ps21.info. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Tonight's event is presented by the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority and co-hosted by the Workforce Housing Coalition of the Greater Seacoast and PS21. The event's lead sponsor is AARP. The lodging sponsor is the Sailmakers House. Event park partners are Seacoast Media Group, PortsmouthNH.com, 3S Art Space, Coraway Film Institute, Riverwoods Durham, and Ambit Engineering. Now I'd like to introduce Sarah Reitzman, Executive Director of the Workforce Housing Coalition of the Greater Seacoast. When I recently spoke to Sarah, she said that was an adequate introduction. <laughs> However, in my email this morning, I got a message telling me that Sarah was recently recognized by the Rising Stars Award program as this year's Civic Leader of the Year. Yeah. 
The award, this award celebrates New Hampshire's remarkable young people. Congratulations, Sarah. Thanks. Thank you, Effie, and thank you, George, and thank you all for coming and spending your Tuesday night talking about accessory dwelling units with us. Uh, my name's Sarah Reitzman. I'm the executive director of the Workforce Housing Coalition of the Greater Seacoast. We are a very small but mighty nonprofit that does advocacy and education and outreach efforts to ensure that housing in our region, which is all over the seacoast of New Hampshire and a little bit of Maine, is affordable to the members of our workforce and the people who we want to live in our communities. And we recognize accessory dwelling units as part of that solution. So I am thrilled to introduce Cole Peterson. Peterson is the an ADU expert. He's visiting New Hampshire from Portland, Oregon. Um, and he, of course, you've gathered, is the author of Backdoor Revolution, the definitive guide to ADU development. Um, so if you like what you hear tonight, as George mentioned, these books are available for sale at a 60% discount in the lobby. You can pay with a credit card or cash. They're only $10. Um, they'll probably be available through the week, maybe into next week. Um, so Peterson is also the owner of Caravan, the first tiny house hotel in the world and organizer of Portland's ADU tour. He consults with homeowners about ADUs on their property and teaches ADU classes for homeowners and for real estate agents on the West Coast. And we're so lucky to have Peterson here. So enough of us talking. Cole, they're all yours. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'm going to introduce myself a little bit more um, and then kind of ask uh, who's in the room today. Um, so I, uh, in 2010, I was, I was looking at a variety of different, um, well, I wanted to create a financially sustainable housing model for myself, um, knowing that housing is the most expensive part of our day-to-day -day existence. Um, I didn't want to be uh, in a position for the rest of my life where I'd be incurring great debts and um, kind of was looking at a variety of different housing options, tiny homes on wheels, co-housing options. And at that point in 2010, I learned about accessory dwelling units which were just kind of in their infancy in Portland, Oregon, where I live. Um, and I decided that, that was gonna be the best option for me. I was going to buy a residential property, single family residential property, build an ADU, move into the ADU, start renting out the primary house, and hopefully that would cover my mortgage and I would live for free for the rest of my life. And lo and behold, it's exactly what happened and it's been working out fabulously ever since. And in the course of, um, <clears throat> in the course of building the ADU, um, I was quickly confronted with the fact there wasn't a lot of information about going through the development process. As an amateur homeowner, I had no idea what I was doing. I had no, no idea how much it was gonna cost to build, what the rules and regulations were, what the best practices for development were. And there wasn't a lot of information available on the, on the web, so I documented on a blog, pdxadu.blogspot.com, which a lot of local Portlanders who were interested in building an ADU started to go to to learn about the process. <clears throat> and then, after I completed the ADU, I decided I was going to just go ahead and start teaching a class out of my ADU for homeowners who wanted to go through the process themselves, and started teaching that class and taught it to like 12 people uh, or 13 people, um, and, and the class sold out, so I offered another one, and I offered another one, and I've been doing that ever since, and I've, so no, I've now taught an eight-hour class, um, started teaching it out of a different venue, and um, I've taught that eight-hour class now to like 2,000 people in Portland. Um, yeah, so, um, so, so that was kind of like I, I was just an, a, a, you know, I'm not, I'm not a professional builder, I'm not a professional designer, I'm not a professional realtor, I'm not a professional lender, appraiser, um, not a professional planner. But in the in the years since I built my first ADU and up to this day, I now, you know, I have become quite steeped in ADUs. I live in an ADU. I eat. ADUs, I sleep in ADUs, I do everything in ADUs all day long, it's all I do. So I know a lot about ADUs and um, and I know about a, a lot about ADUs as it pertains to all those fields, but I don't know about all those fields and all the expertise that comes along with all those different industries. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so in 20, um, 20, like 
13, I started Caravan the Tiny House Hotel with my wife. And um, through Caravan the Tiny House Hotel, um, which were, were tiny homes on wheels, they're not ADUs. We're going to talk about that in a minute. I started running the citywide ADU tour, which was a way to get as many people as possible access to actually seeing physical on the ground built ADUs. Um, and the tour sold out. Um, and we had like 800 people the first tour, and we capped off the tickets because we didn't know if the ADUs, these small little structures, could handle that many people. And um, anyway, so we now have run that tour like like five times, and they, they we get about a thousand people a tour, and um, and that's a great way to kind of expose homeowners to what these things are, and meet the builders and designers who worked on them, and talk to the homeowners who've been through the process themselves. I also started a website called AccessoryDwellings.org with another um, ADU advocate in Portland, and that website is intended to kind of help. It's a group blog that's intended to help disperse information about ADU development and kind of best practices for policymakers. And then in 20, um, 2015 or so, I started doing consultations for homeowners who wanted to build ADUs on their property. In 2016, started writing this book. In 2018, finished the book, and here I am. And so now I'm doing a lot of work um, helping other jurisdictions who want to see more ADUs built um, to uh, kind of get off the ground. Because ADUs are going to become a very big phenomena in the United States. They're just on the precipice at this point of, of reaching that point. Um, and um, we'll get more into that later in the presentation. But, um, but yeah, I, there's a few reasons why that's going to be the case, and I'm pretty certain that's going to happen. Um, and so that's why I wrote this book, to kind of be on the, kind of help steer that conversation, because there's a whole lot of things that need to go into making a good ADU program from a policy perspective, as well as enabling homeowners to develop them. Um, so to, before I go on, let's find out who's in the room tonight. I'm not going to have everybody introduce themselves, so, but let's do something like this. I'm going to ask, you know, please raise your hand if you, you are in the following category. If you are a homeowner and you were, are aspiring to build an ADU on your property, please raise your hand. Okay, that's a good number, like probably 50% maybe. Um, great. <clears throat> if you are like a planner, a, like a municipal um, employee uh, of some sort, and you're working on AD related stuff, please raise your hand. Okay. And if you are a uh, realtor interested in ADUs, please raise your hand. No. If you are a professional designer or architect, great. If you are a professional builder, please raise your hand. Cool. Um, I'm probably missing some. Any lenders? Lenders, appraisers? No. We need some lenders and appraisers in the house. All right. Um, and affordable housing advocates? Awesome. OK. Um, and I would say smart growth advocates, but I'm sure everybody in this room is kind of a smart growth advocate of some sort. So let's say if you are, if you work in another NGO that has, you know, real, you know, has an interest in this in terms of urban infill issues, raise your hand. Anybody from the green building sector? No. Okay. All right. Uh, one or two. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, that's that's useful. Um, so here we go. ADUs. What are ADUs? ADUs are secondary housing units on single fam single family lots. That definition is, sounds simple, but it's actually kind of complicated. So I'm going to unpack it a little bit. Um, these are our, these are all viable structural forms of ADUs, but but the but the definition that I provided secondary housing units on single family lots um, is really what I want to focus on for a moment. <clears throat> so it's a secondary housing unit. It's not a third housing unit. It's not a fourth housing unit. Um, uh, in the United States, there is no city in anywhere in the United States where you can build a, two ADUs on a on a on a residential lot. The only city it, just um, just uh, uh, notably, that where you can build two ADUs is Vancouver, British Columbia, and they're the leader in, in of ADUs anywhere in North America. Um, these are housing units. Housing units is a term that means uh, it has uh, a, a space that has um, space for uh, sanitation, sleeping, and cooking, and some hangout space. And um, it's on a residential lot. Um, ADUs don't actually have to be on a residential lot. They could theoretically be on a commercially zoned property, but by and large, or, or ADUs have to be, uh, they're kind of architecturally subservient or accessory or ancillary to a primary dwelling unit. So you could theoretically have a primary dwelling unit on a commercially zoned property, but by and large, 
primary dwelling units are tend to be on resident, residentially zoned properties, so it's fair to just say ADUs are, generally speaking, on residential lots. So, um, so they're, and they're accessory, they're secondary housing units, so they're always, by virtue of the fact that they are um, accessory, they're smaller than the primary dwelling unit. They're not supposed to be the same size as the, as the, as the other housing unit. <coughs> that would be a duplex, for example. Um, but so getting back into the structural forms of ADUs, so all of these different structural forms can house those functions of being secondary housing units on single family lots. This is a, an example of a backyard cottage style detached ADU. This is an example of a basement conversion ADU. This is an example of a ADU above a garage and this is a garage conversion ADU. Notably, um, I'll, I'll, today I'll be referring um, largely to data that uh, we have uh, derived from various uh, surveys that we've done in Portland. And I'm gonna refer to that not just because I'm from Portland and I'm intimately familiar with that market, but it, because it's A, it's the only place where th there's a, a very concentrated population of ADUs anywhere in the United States, and B, it's the only place where there have been statistically valid studies of ADUs done. So for those two reasons, I'm gonna I'm gonna refer to it. And um, Portland, you know, does have extremely good, meaning very flexible, very lenient policies and regulations around ADUs. And in that light, one of the things that Portland does is that there's any any of these structural reforms are totally viable on any residential property. And so in, in that way, uh, you can kind of say that it's a good expression of what would happen in an unfettered marketplace. And on that note, 60% uh, or so 50 to 60% of ADUs are detached new construction. 25% uh, are basement conversions. Now, basement conversions um, are an example of an internal carve-out ADU. So a basement conversion is one manifestation of an internal carve-out ADU, but you could have, say, an attic conversion ADU or a portion of the primary floor could be an accessory dwelling in it. But generally, in Portland anyway, where there's a lot of basements, basement conversion ADUs are fairly common. And then about 25% of ADUs are ADUs above a garage or garage conversion ADUs. So that you could say is the natural kind of market expression of what um, of what ADUs might manifest as structurally. But of course, it's somewhat tied into the housing form and the lot sizes of properties in Portland. Um, these are not ADUs. These are tiny houses on wheels. And I always like to talk about tiny houses on wheels for a moment during ADU presentations, not because I want to talk about them to uh, focus on them, but rather just to kind of clarify that these are not accessory dwelling units. Um, the most notable giveaway is that they're on wheels. ADUs are not on wheels. And, um, the, but you know, just important, the reason that these things are, are oftentimes conflated with ADUs is because the media um, uh, coverage of tiny houses on wheels and ADUs kind of conflate the two. They'll put, the, they'll put tiny homes and ADUs in the same sentence, mixing the two up. They'll talk of an article about ADUs and show a picture of a tiny house on wheels. So I spend most of my life just kind of saying they're not the same thing at all. In fact, they have nothing in common except that they're both smaller than the average American dwelling unit, which is good. I'm a fan of both, but these are not legal to live in anywhere in the United States in residential zones. You can't insure them, you can't finance them, um, you can't legally rent them out. Um, I'm a fan of them, I like them, I encourage people to live in them, but it's almost a form of civil disobedience if you choose to do so, because you can't do it legally. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, they have, they, had, they have potential if the rules and regulations were better for them, but right now, you know, there's no potential for them to really take off, despite the fact that there's H, you know, five HGTV shows about them, uh, confusing, confusing everybody, thinking that they're legal, they're not. Um, so, uh, actually I should say they are legal, but the habitation of them is not. So, anyway, um, so th this is my hotel in Portland, um, and this, this is in fact a legal use of, of Tiny Homes on Wheels. It's a commercially zoned property. People are staying there for a short period of time. We followed rules and regulations and did it by right, um, and they're connected to sewer. But generally speaking, and there's some movement I, sh I should say there's some movement in some jurisdictions to kind of create legal pathways to do this, but it's still kind of it in its infancy. So with that, with that said, I'm gonna you know encapsulate the tiny house on wheels conversation and say that's that. We're not talking about tiny house on wheels anymore. But if there's questions that come up, 
feel free to uh, bring them up. But uh, but I like to focus on ADUs because they are legal to build, um, and there is kind of institutional support for them, meaning you can get loans for them in some ways, shape, and in some ways. Um, you can insure them, you can finance them, you can legally rent them out. And like Tiny House on Wheels, they're addressing some of the same, they have the potential anyway to address some of the same problems, socially, environmentally, economically, that Tiny House on Wheels um, can address. So the, this is a backyard cottage style ADU. This is an ADU um, in the back of a workshop. So it's, it's structurally connected to a workshop. This is a garage conversion ADU. This is a bump out attached ADU. And um, this, is, this is where things get kind of uh, interesting. This is kind of the quintessential ADU slide that summarizes some fascinating things about accessory dwelling units. I'm going to stand over here so everybody can see. Um, so in 2010, this nuclear family is living in the yellow house, renting out the ADU in the back. 2020, they become a nuclear family with 2.3 kids, move into the ADU in the primary house. Their kind of teenager doesn't want to live in the, under the same roof, so she goes into the back. And then 2040, the parents become empty nesters. The kids go out to school. They decide they can move into an ADU, a smaller size unit, and start renting out the primary house. And this, this life cycle is kind of one of the intrinsic things that people really like about ADUs. Um, but, but, uh, but interestingly, the survey that was done in 2013 of permitted ADU owners found that, indeed, the number one motivation behind why people want to build ADUs, statistically speaking, is rental income potential. Um, the second most common motivation is, what's that? Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, the second most common um, motivation is multi-generational or flexibility for multi-generational housing. And really those two motivations encompass like 95% of why people want to build ADUs in some way, shape, or form. And oftentimes it's a combination of those, which is exemplified by this slide. Um, but the other interesting thing about this slide is it shows this family living on this property for 30 years. Now, we don't actually know that the average ADU owner lives on their property for 30 years, in part because ADUs have only become like a, a new phenomena or a re-emerging phenomena in the last 10 years or so in a couple cities. So we don't really have the statistical basis to actually back up this idea, but what I'm about to say I believe will be true. The average American household lives on a property for like five to seven years right now. Um, and I believe that people who build ADUs on the property will tend to hold on to that property for a longer period of time. Why is that? Well, it's in part because this ADU costs more to construct than it adds in value to the property, which might on its surface sound like a bad bad thing for ADUs. But what that, what that means is that intrinsically, ADUs are not gonna be developed by uh, professional housing developers who are buying a single-family residential property with a house on it, building an ADU, and then selling it to make a profit. It's not, that, that would not make financial sense. They would lose money doing that. Where it does make sense is if somebody's going to have long-term vested interest in the property, going to be holding onto it and renting out one unit or the other, then it starts to make a lot of sense. Um, and the longer you hold onto it, the more profitable it is. So it's not a good short-term investment, it's a really good long-term investment. And um, <clears throat> so as a result of that, the only people who have vested economic interest in potentially building an ADU would be those who are holding on to the property for a long period of time. Who's holding on to residential properties for a long period of time? Homeowners. So all of a sudden, homeowners are the agents of development of this housing form as opposed to professional developers, which means that unlike every other housing form in the United States, ADUs are going to be developed by average amateur homeowner developers who've never developed housing before, which is why I do what I do, which is educate homeowners about the development process, because all of a sudden homeowners have to become developers. And there's a whole lot that's, that, that becoming a developer encompasses that is, it's not easy. I mean, people do it as a job full time, and uh, it's, it's a, it encompasses a lot of different fields and industries. Um, this is a household from the 1950s, nuclear family household. And this is a three bedroom, four bedroom house. And in the United States right now, roughly one quarter of all households are nuclear family households. And roughly three quarters of all properties in the United States are single family, or housing units, are, are single family residential housing units that are three bedroom, four bedroom housing units. So there's a little bit of a mismatch there. Um, meanwhile, 
you know, the average household size, the average households are, are comprised of, of, you know, a variety of one and two percent households. And that's representing probably three quarters of households in the United States, according to the census. Um, and and so these 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 household configurations are 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 kind of forced largely to buy into properties that are perhaps way bigger than what they want, but that's what's available them to them on the marketplace because that's what most of the housing stock is consisting of. These ho homes not only are way bigger than what they want, but they are necessarily way more expensive than what they can afford, and there's way way more heating and cooling costs associated with owning a structure like that, which has way more greenhouse gas emissions than a smaller structure might have. There's a lot more maintenance, and there's a lot more um, cleaning that, that comes along with those larger homes. If you look at the household sizes from 1940 to 2016, the, um, you know, this is all census data here. The average household size back in 1940 was roughly 3.6. It's gone down to roughly 2.6 in 2016. Why is this? Well, <clears throat> there's been a number of demographic and economic changes that have occurred over the last 50 years. Um, we are living longer lives, for example, and as a result, if we have kids, proportionally, uh, the proportion of our life in which we are living in nuclear family households with those kids is, is, is shorter so, um, than it used to be. We are having fewer kids if we're having kids at all. Many of us are opting not to have kids, but if we are having kids, we're having fewer kids. Um, a lot more of us are cho choosing to have kids later in life if we're having kids at all. Um, and more and more people are having, uh, you know, divorces or separations. And more people are choosing to be single parent, uh, single parents. So all, it, it, and if we are having kids, we're having fewer of them. So with all those vari variables combined, there's this inevitable trend of decreasing household sizes. So um, as a result, even if the population in a given city was not growing at all, we would still need more housing to accommodate all the new households that are being formed out of that same population over the last 60 years. And this, this, this issue is exacerbated and very obvious when you start to look at just the one-person households in cities in the United States. For example, Washington, D.C., 45% of households are one-person households. Meanwhile, we have just the opposite thing happening with our home sizes. Our home sizes are going from an average of roughly 900 square feet in 1950 to an average of roughly 2,600 feet in 2015. So you take, those two, you take those two stats and you overlay them and you see that our per square foot per capita for residential uh, structures is going from 292 square feet in 1950 to 1,023 in 2013. I feel like Al Gore right now. Do you guys? Yeah, this is, a, yeah. Um, so, um, so this is what's happening with our, per, our, 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 our footprint per capita in the United States as a result of these two trends converging. Then 2013 comes along, Oregon Department of Environmental Quality uh, conducts this study on green building practices. Now, my background is, is all environmental. I worked at the EPA for seven years studying environmental study, studies, environmental planning. That's what I do, or that's what I did. And, um, and they did this really amazing study where they studied all these green building practices and were looking at the, the life cycle greenhouse gas emissions that were resulting from various green building uh, practices. And so they studied all the you know, very common green building practices, such as using SIP construction, double slid walls, um, advanced framing, straw bale construction, and all of these techniques lower greenhouse, or you know, reduce greenhouse gas emissions over the life cycle of the building, meaning the construction, the habitation, and the deconstruction of the building. They're all, they're all effective in various ways, but at the last minute, they threw size in there as a green building practice just to see what, what that would do. And to the amazement of everybody on this survey, or everybody in the study, um, size was by far the most effective way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So all the other techniques that were out there that all these green building standards and programs were promoting weren't even holding a feather or candle to the amount of emissions that uh, you could reduce the structure by by simply reducing the size of the structure. And specifically within the course of a year, 
not looking at the whole life cycle greenhouse gas uh, issue, but rather just in the course of a year, the biggest uh, the biggest reason that we're using a lot of emissions in the course of a year is 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 uh, relating to the uh, heating and cooling needs that, that we have in our homes. And so if you take the average size Oregon house, which is roughly the same size as in the US, 2,200 square feet roughly, you build that home to code, meaning you're putting in the least amount of insulation that code would allow you to put in and the least amount of air sealing. So like R19, R21 insulation, let's say. Um, that uses 90 million British thermal units of energy in the course of a year. And if you build that home to advanced performance standards, meaning you put in a lot of air sealing and insulation, it will reduce the amount of em emissions significantly to you know, 55 million British thermal units a year of energy, which is a great thing. But amazingly, if you just simply reduce the size of the structure to the largest possible ADU you could do, in Portland anyway, is roughly 800 square feet, that ADU built to code will use less emissions in the course of a year than that average size home that's built to advanced performance standards. So, um, and, and then of, of course, if you build that ADU to high performance standards, good air, air sealing and insulation, it'll reduce the emissions further still. So again, ADUs are like, or small homes in general, are proving to have these very significant um, environmental impacts that were not previously understood. Um, if you, I guess one important caveat that I wanna always put out there with this slide is, if there were five people living in this average size house, they would use less emissions per capita than one person living in that 800 square foot ADU. But the reality is, based on the previous slides that we were looking at, most households are not five person households anymore. That's a thing that is kind of the, of the bygone era from the 1950s. That doesn't really happen much anymore. It's mostly one and two person households. So we have a lot of one and two person, person households living in 2200 square foot homes or 2600 square foot homes. Let me, um, let's, let's, uh, make, I'll go, I'll go for one more slide and then we will, or a few more slides and then we'll take a, we'll t do some Q&A. Um, so if you look at the, um, percentage of homes, uh, that are, that are single family housing units as opposed to multifamily housing units in the United States, most cities are, are, um, consist largely of single family residential housing units. And so um, as a result of these kind of interesting kind of demographic trends and economic trends of people not necessarily needing these large homes anymore, uh, we are seeing a lot of ADU development and we have been for a while. The problem is that a lot of the ADUs that have been developed are informal ADUs or unpermitted ADUs or illegal ADUs. Um, and um, so I, I want to spend a moment here just talking about the cons of doing a formal permanent ADU and then the pros of doing a formal permanent ADU to understand the difference. So the cons of the cons of doing a permanent ADU are that there might be use restrictions that come into a, in, in effect if you build a permanent ADU, and we can talk more about that later. Um, there's additional parking requirements that might come into effect where you might need to provide an additional off-street parking spot. If you build a permanent ADU, it's a lengthy, bureaucratic, and expensive process to do so, most likely. It's more expensive to comply with building code than not to comply with building code, and your taxes will go up. Anytime you do any permitted work, it will necessarily cause your taxes to go up in some way, shape, or form. And here are some of the pros of doing a permitted ADU. If you do a permanent ADU, the, the um, value of your home or your property can go up. And so if you build, let's say, a $100,000 ADU, it's going to increase the value of your property. Therefore, you can access funds that would have, so if, you're, if you bought your house at $300,000, let's say, out of the $100,000 ADU, and the property values had gone up, you could access you know, up to $375,000 of value from that property, which means that you could do a cash out refinance and pay off any bridge loan debts that you had incurred in the development of the ADU. Uh, it also means that a home buyer who is gonna buy your property from you can access loans that are commensurate with what you believe that property to be worth. In contrast, if the property had an in unpermitted ADU, an appraiser wouldn't be able to attribute value to the, uh, that is commensurate with the improvements that you made. 
Therefore, the home buyer m might not be able to access sufficient funds to purchase the value, the pro purchase the property at the value of what you think it's worth. Um, you can legally rent out the unit if it's if it's a permanent ADU. You can easily insure it if it's a permanent ADU. And you have a degree of quality assurance when you're going through the permitted formal process. Um, when you're doing the designs, uh, those are going to get reviewed by the city. And then during the ins uh, building process, the structure will be inspected. And so you have a degree of quality assurance when you're going through doing it formally. Um, so there's good news and there's bad news, but mostly good news with all the unpermitted ADUs that are out there. Number one. Um, to the extent that ADUs have impacts on cities in terms of parking impacts and um, other impacts that people are concerned about, um, those impacts already exist. In fact, I would, I would surmise that there will never be as much impact from permanent ADUs as there already is from unpermitted ADUs. So there really isn't anything to worry about if you were to be, you know, open the floodgates to ADUs I don't think there's any reason to feel afraid that there will be any impacts that'll be noticeable or significant. <coughs> um, and permitted ADUs uh, will provide safer ADUs than unpermitted ADUs. So that's another good reason to perhaps consider uh, permitted ADUs. I'm gonna do two more slides and we'll take a break. Um, so just to drive that home a little bit, one of the major concerns that always comes up in every community in the country is if you allow ADUs, God forbid, there will be huge parking problems and it'll, it'll be crazy. Um, you won't be able to park anywhere because uh, there'll be ADUs on every single property. And I'm here to tell you that is absolutely not true. There is no statistical evidence to support those assertions. There's nothing to worry about. In Portland, which is a city that's by far leading the pack with more ADU development than everybody else by like years and years, um, there is a total of like 1.5% of all single family residential properties has one, an ADU. So that means like one out of every 90 or so properties has an ADU. And every ADU represents probably, uh, according to the 2013 survey, about 0.9 vehicles. And so, for every 100 ADUs, there's one additional car that's being parked. And so this is representative of the impact, statistically speaking, of ADU development on the additional parking that is um, happening as a result of ADU development, this, this one blue dot. So there is no statistically valid way to assert that ADUs are gonna cause a big parking problem. And um, furthermore, Portland doesn't even have an off-street parking requirement whatsoever. So in a city like Portland, you can presume there would be significantly more impact from parking than a city that had off-street parking requirements. And even in Portland, there's no impact. There's no noticeable impact. Even in Portland where they are clustered, not one for every 100 properties, but rather clustered in great abundance like this, there's no, there's no noticeable impact from parking. So I just wanted to bring this home because I know this always comes up in every in every city. So let's let's take a break at this point and maybe do a few uh, questions. We'll do like three questions. Um, is somebody does somebody have a mic that they can bring around? Awesome. And there's a question back there. Great. Thanks. So uh, I've heard you say tiny homes are not ADUs and small homes are different than ADUs. So what is the definition of an ADU? Secondary housing in, on a single family lot. Single family specifically. Yeah, like I said, it, it could theoretically be on a commercially zoned property, but generally speaking, yes, yeah, it's, it's gonna be on a single family residentially zoned property. So the fact that it could be on a commercial lot doesn't mean that it has to be on a single family lot. That's correct, yeah. Okay, yeah. so do each, does each town decide what makes an ADU an ADU, or is that a building code? Yeah, it's actually, yeah, it's, it's a town by town thing, but the generic definition that I provided, secondary housing in a single family lot would be applicable anywhere. Um, and then town by town, for example, here, they, you know, ADUs might, certain types of structural forms of ADUs might be allowed in certain areas within certain parts of residential zones, and other structural forms might be viable in other zones. And 
the meaning a separate building from a basement ADU. Yeah, like a detached accessory structure. And and after the after I speak, uh, we're gonna have a city planner come up and answer some of the specific zoning questions about some of the things you're probably interested in. And probably like pre-existing buildings would be my specific. Yeah, in pre-existing ac accessory structures. So so let's I'll, I'll take a minute to to just just give you some like. Um, terminology that might help decipher some of this stuff. So there's, there's um, you, um, an accessory dwelling unit is this you know housing unit, but you can have an accessory structure which is not an ADU. An example of an accessory structure would be a garage, a studio, a shed, a yoga studio, um, any one of those. So those are all examples of 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 of, of the accessory structures. You can have permitted accessory structures such as a garage. You could have an unpermitted accessory structure such as a shed or a yurt. And there's going to be differences in interpretation for from a city's point of view of which of those types of accessory structures are viable to be converted to an ADU, provided the number of other standards are met. And I'll, again, I'll kind of refer you to the city planner on answering some of those specific questions. But that terminology might help decipher, you know, help help, help you speak their, the language that city planners use. We have another question back here. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Bob, and I have a, a couple of questions. My main concern is the statute of uh, 674. And what Portsmouth says they allow is a uh, maximum size of 750 square feet. Now, if I'm uh, correct, I believe that is the old statute, which is relegated to what's called an in-law apartment. And the reason that ADUs came about in this state anyways is because builders like myself that have a certain situation in a couple different towns that are 900 square feet and can't be reduced to 750 square feet, four in-laws are now being called ADUs. And luckily now I'm able to uh, craft those uh, properties of 900 square feet into an ADU permitted use building in a conforming zone. So my question is, why do, do you know why Portsmouth has relegated it to 750 square feet? That's question number one. Number two is, does it, an attached ADU technically have to have the ability of the homeowner or the original owner of the house access into the ADU via a separate entrance? And are the uh, permittable processes for egress windows the same in, in an ADU as it would be in a... Um, in-law apartment, so to speak. So kind of three questions. Yeah, good questions. I'm going to defer to the city planner on all those. I could answer those in Portland, but I'm not going to try to answer them here. But I'll, I'll give you a couple generic kind of policy responses, and then I'll let the city planner handle those later. Um, so in general, as an advocate for ADUs, I'm in favor of having the more liberal the standard, the better. And so, you know, I whether a city has, you know, allows a structure to be up to 750 square feet or 800 square feet or 900 square feet. Uh, somewhere in that ballpark is about what, you know, seems to be about the right size. So uh, so in the ca in your case, if you had a 900 square foot structure, yeah, the, the two approaches you could apply, you could, it, it, and you wanted to get that to be a permanent ADU, but it was too big, you could apply for some conditional uh, review of your, of your application or a secondary kind of workaround that you could consider, and I'm a huge fan of workarounds, and loopholes, um, is you know you could effectively lop off 100 square feet of that ADU by closing it off with an, with an interior kind of firewall separation for 100 square feet and give an exterior access to that additional 100 square feet as a shed. It's kind of a silly workaround, but you could do it. And in fact, um, there's you know you could you could you could I could even say that there is in fact a lot of ADUs that are built that have that are 800 square feet that have an additional sh uh, uh, space tacked on so that the occupant of the ADU who is very limited in terms of their um, square footage that they have access to can have additional uh, long-term storage for their bikes for their luggage for their canoes for their lawnmowers that kind of thing so that could be a silly workaround that you might have to uh, you know do if you can't get a conditional use exception to your situation. Um, well, let's take one more question and we'll, I'll move on. It's exciting that a Portland is taking the forefront in uh, this um, option, granny flats and uh, in law apartments. Um, has Portland's medium gross rental income with all these um, 
A ADU units, has it fallen? Not at all. No. No, and, and like, you know, importantly, it's it, it, like, it's um, 1.5% of all the residential housing units are ADUs. Less than 1% of all housing units, if you include all the multifamily housing units, are ADUs. So it's a very statistically insignificant portion of the housing stock, even in the leading country, leading city in the country. So no, it hasn't. If there were enough of them, theoretically, maybe, but I don't even like to talk about the pie in the sky idea of getting 10% of all properties having ADUs. We're not even close to that. And um, so, um, so no, it hasn't. Um, so big picture, yeah, the more housing units you have, the theoretically that would offset the, um, you know, that would make the overall supply of housing go up, which would make co cost of housing go down. Um, but just to focus in on this question for a moment, um, uh, some of the important points to, to understand about ADUs that I think are, are useful from an affordable, kind of affordable, naturally affordable housing perspective is, no, they're not. They're not creating like what I would call affordable housing, in the capital A affordable ho housing, regulated affordable housing sense of the word. Rather, they are creating naturally affordable housing in that they are, uh, because of their small size, they're inherently going to go for less money than the neighbor than the housing units that are adjacent to them. So the 800 square foot ADU would rent for less than, than the 2,500 square foot house next door. And, and um, in general, ADUs will rent for roughly the same amount as a one bedroom unit will. And that's been borne out by a few different studies. So it's not like cheap, you know, like whatever a new one bedroom apartment unit would go for, that's what an ADU might go for. From the homeowner's point of view, it creates a source of income. So it allows them to potentially age in place or stay in on their property or, um, offset their mortgage. So in that sense, it's affordable. The other important thing to know about ADUs from three studies that have been done from San Francisco, uh, East Bay, San Francisco, Edmonton, um, um, and Alberta, um, Canada, and Portland have shown that um, 18 to 20 percent of ADUs have rented out. So 80 percent of ADUs have rented out at market rate, i.e. the cost of a one-bedroom um, apartment unit. 18 to 20 percent have rented out at significantly less than the cost of an apartment. And that has been probably, you could probably guess that that would go to like friends. And then 8% of ADUs are renting out at $0 per month in all three studies. So even without any regulated affordable housing overlay, um, ADUs are, are naturally seem to be providing um, uh, affor you know, either you know, free housing or very affordable housing. Um, without any governmental intervention whatsoever, just due to the nature of the of a philanthropic or you know a nice homeowner who's just doing what they want to do, um, and those eight percent that are going out for free are probably going to family members. So ADUs will, in some way, shape, or form, be providing affordable housing in that unregulated sense. Um, but I always like to kind of tease apart those nuances because. Um, there's a lot of affordable housing groups that are interested in ADUs, you know, solely with the lens of wanting it to solve the affordable housing crisis. And I'm like, well, if you if you overregulate ADUs, and make them be capital A affordable, Section 8 only or whatever, nobody's going to build them. So you kind of need the market, the free market, to be able to work. And it just so happens that this form of housing does provide natural affordable housing as opposed to regulated affordable housing. All right, so I'm going to move on into the regulation slide, which might inform the conversation that comes up with uh, with the city planner after me. Um, <clears throat> so ADUs are subject, if we're talking about detached ADUs, ADUs are subject to setback requirements. Um, so this is an example of a side yard setback. This is an example of a rear yard setback, five feet. Um, this is an example of a front yard setback. So in Portland, you have to be 40 feet from the front of the property line, five feet from the side, five feet from the rear. Incidentally, from an advocacy point of view, the lower the setback, the better. So, um, so a, a, a big rear yard setback requirement, such as 20 feet or 30 feet, would be a problem. Because if we're talking about where we want to have urban infill, where we want to have more ha housing is more walkable, bikeable areas. Where you have more walkable, bi bikeable areas, lots are smaller. Lots that are smaller can't afford to respect a 20-foot setback in the rear or a 30-foot setback in the rear. So you want to have a, a small rear yard setback. Um, then you have to respect a separation between the primary structure and the detached structure because of fire, 
fi the you know uh, fire code issues. So fire could theoretically jump from one structure to another. So sometimes there's a separate fire code that would state that the house must be six feet from the ADU. Um, then there's uh, parking space requirements, and this is another big thing. Um, in my book, I harp on on parking requirements quite a bit um, because they are so they they obstruct so many ADUs from being built because. Um, building an extra nine by 18 foot parking space on a residential property, especially a small urban info one, is can be near impossible and can prevent a lot of people from being able to build ADUs. Um, and I, I believe based on the stats I was just showing you that there's no statistical impact from, uh, from ADU development on actual parking supply. Um, so um, I don't think that's a good argument for people. I realize that every, every community says, you know, we have terrible parking problems, you know, we have Everybody here is is you know is afraid of all the parking issues that ADUs are going to cause. I hear that everywhere. It's just not based in stats or math or any reality. So um, I really would like to people have people question that 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 assumption. Um, <clears throat> so then there's uh, maximum sizes of ADUs. Um, the, the and there's two there's two uh, two different standards that different jurisdictions use. One is like the interior habitable uh, squ square footage. So that's like interior drywall to drywall. So in Portland, it's 800 square feet. Here, maybe it's 750. Um, then there's another standard. Sometimes ADUs have to be only up to a certain percentage of the size of the, of the primary house. In Portland, it's 75%. So you, you couldn't build an 800 square foot ADU if your primary house was 900 square feet, let's say. Um, <clears throat> then there's another standard that looks at the, uh, the building lot coverage. So that's like how much of your lot from a bird's perspective is covered with structures because you don't want to cover too much of the property with impervious cover. You need to keep some green space. Then there's height requirements. Um, how high can the structure be? Can it be a two-story structure? If so, how is that measured? Um, is it measured at the midpoint of the gable here or is it measured at the peak of the gable? But effectively, we want, as an ADU advocate, we would want to see a code that allows for a two-story ADU. It's pretty important to be able to fit two stories without too much difficulty. Um, and the reason that's important is because if you can't fit two stories, then in order to fit an, an, um, an ADU that's big enough to, to, to hold two people in it, then that, that would ha effectively have, to, like I like to put out there as a threshold that uh, for two people, there should be like a 400 square foot per capita kind of threshold. So if you're trying to design a space that's for two people, it needs to be about 800 square feet. If it's 800 square feet and, it, and, a, st and a structure can only be one story high, then that 800 square feet is gonna take up too much of the backyard and people won't wanna give up that much of the backyard. So you kinda need to facilitate the ability for homeowners to build a two story ADU. Um, then there's some exterior finished material uh, requirements sometimes. So some certain jur jurisdictions will say the roof pitch must match that of the main house. The trim must match that, that of the main house, or, and the and the siding and the eaves. Um, so those are other kind of like what are called development regulations, and those development regulations kind of vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, so and and th so th there there's some vernacular for you to consider as you think about what questions you have for the city planners. Um, so total cost of ADU development. ADUs are expensive; they're not cheap, and um, the way I like to think about the cost of ADU development, and we're gonna talk about detached new construction for a moment here, because that's kind of the simplest way to start this conversation. Um, there's like a fixed cost of housing development. So you cannot build a one square foot ADU for like 20 bucks. It's gonna cost you, the starting cost of doing an ADU with all the infrastructure that goes into it is gonna be about 80,000 bucks or maybe 100,000 bucks, depending on where you are. Um, I think the costs in Port, uh, Portsmouth are going to be a little bit less than Portland, but not that much less, both for rental income and for the cost of construction. So I think you can take all my numbers and kind of um, uh, shrink them a tiny bit, maybe by like 10 to 20%. Um, so in Portland, the starting cost of ADU development is going to be $100,000 for a um, small detached accessory dwelling unit. And then it's going to go up to the the average cost uh, might go up to about one hundred and eighty thousand dollars for an eight hundred square foot ADU. One of the things to note here is that there's a marginal cost per square foot increase, but from a homeowner's perspective, uh, the bigger the ADU you can do, really the better it is financially in, in the sense that 
um, additional square footage is only, it, it's pretty marginal to add additional square footage to the cost of the housing unit. And so, um, uh, uh, you know, if you can afford to go up to the largest possible ADU that the code allows you to do, that's usually the most rational thing to do. On the other hand, you might not want an 800 square foot unit on, in your backyard because it might be too big. So that would be one reason not to build up to the maximum square footage. And also, even though it's only a little bit more expensive, it is more expensive, so you might just not have enough money to build the largest possible ADU you can build. Um, <clears throat> so that's the bad news. ADUs are expensive. Um, I'm going to go a, into a, a, a more nuance about the cost for a moment, and then we'll take some Q&A about costs. So the good news is that the break-even period for ADUs is quite impressive. So if you look at the how long it takes for the cost of ADU construction to be paid for by the additional rental income that you can get from the property once you've built the ADU, that's where ADUs start to make a lot of financial sense. So Joe builds an 800 square foot ADU, he spends $160,000, lives in the house, rents out the ADU for 1500 bucks a month, that's $18,000 a year, that translates to an 8.9 year payback for Joe to pay for that structure. In scenario B, Joe builds the same ADU, he lives in the ADU, rents out the house for 2,500 bucks a month. And instead of, instead of 1,500 bucks a month, he's running for 25, he's making $30,000 a year from that. And then it becomes a 5.3 year payback for him. And now he rents out both the primary dwelling unit and the ADU is making $4,000 a month, that's $48,000 a year, that's a 3.3 year payback for Joe, except now Joe has to live in the tiny house on wheels in his backyard. So all of those paybacks are pretty good, and those aren't even accounting. Those aren't, aren't even budgeting or accounting for the contributory value that the ADU is adding to the property. So when you start to add that into the mix, if you look at you know, let's assume that seventy-five percent of that value, one hundred and sixty thousand dollar structural improvement you're making to your property is being added into the value of the property if you were to resell it. So that would be adding roughly like one hundred and twenty thousand dollars of value then it, it's only going to take like four, it, it, to, to make up the $40,000 difference, it's only going to take 2.2 years if you're renting out the ADU. In other words, after 2.2 years, you could sell the property and not have lost money in the process because you would have made $40,000 and made $120,000 extra as a result of the ADU being added to the property. If you live in the ADU and rent out the primary house, it's only a 1.3 year payback. So this becomes an extremely good proposition in terms of a break-even period. Of course, there's a lot more you could put into the calculation here of thinking about what the break-even period is, which I don't have time to go into, but I lay it out pretty clearly in my book. Professional developers think about net operating income and a whole lot of different variables that come into, a, come into, a, uh, come into effect there, such as property tax increases, your income tax implications, and other things like insurance costs, vacancy rates, etc. But bottom line is, for most people, ADUs tend to pay for themselves in seven to 10 years and um, in, with like a detached new construction ADU. And this is an example of a detached new construction ADU. But let's talk for a moment about a non, uh, something that isn't new construction. This is a conversion of an existing garage, 200 square foot garage. Um, in this case, they had to actually re replace the whole foundation and so they had to lift up the structure and put in a new foundation. So this was not a cheap garage conversion. For a 200 square foot ADU, it cost like 70,000 um, bucks. But that's still significantly less than it would have cost to build that structure from scratch. So that's one example of a conversion. Here's another example of a conversion, a basement conversion. Um, basement conversions, it's a pre-existing structure. So you don't have to build that structure from scratch, which means you don't have to do the foundation, you don't have to do the walls. And in general, if assuming that there's no big problems with the structure, meaning the, the, the foundation, there's no big water intrusion issues already pre-existing, um, conversions tend to cost like half the cost of new construction. And that's, that's a big kind of, uh, there's a bunch of assumptions embedded in that, uh, but, but conversions could be a lot cheaper. So, so whereas um, a new detached ADU might cost $160,000 for 800 square feet, a conversion might cost seventy to ninety thousand dollars. So, ADUs are expensive. We've understood that now. So, what are the ways that people on the ground are actually paying for these things in real life? 
here's how they're doing it. ADUs are, unfortunately, right now, not easy to finance, and we'll go into that in a little bit more depth here, but for now, this is what people are doing. So number one, if you've owned a property for a period of time, it has inflated in value, and as a result of that inflation, um, if it's gone from $200,000 to $300,000, that means you can access that additional $100,000 of appreciation in the form of a home equity line of credit or a cash out refinance. A home equity line of credit is a term that looks at, it's a secondary mortgage, so above and beyond your primary mortgage. You, so you bought your house for $200,000, you put $25,000 down, you have a $175,000 mortgage, it's increased in value to $300,000. That means that the another bank will say, okay, we can see that you have more value in that property that, that you will give you a loan against. And, um, and then that sits as a checking account uh, that you can access if and when you ever need to do so. You can do whatever you want with that money. You can buy a Ferrari. You can pay for a kid to go to school. Or you can build an ADU with it. The bank doesn't care. So that's one tool. Another tool is a cash out refinance. Cash out refinance is where instead of creating a secondary mortgage, the bank says, okay, your house has gone to $300,000 of value. So we're going to pay off your first mortgage. We'll give you $275,000 to play with pay off your first mortgage of 175 so you have $100,000 to do whatever you want with. Again, you can do whatever you want with it. The differences between these two options are that with a cash out refinance, A, you have to pay for uh, re-originating that first mortgage, which costs like five to $7,000, and B, you're locking into a 30-year fixed amortized like mortgage. So depending really, uh, this is where I'd say like beyond a little bit of basic information that I provide in the book, and what we just covered, you'd probably want to go to a mortgage advisor to determine which, which approach is going to be right for you. This is usually the way that most people pay for the majority of the development of their ADU because this is where most people have most of their cash uh, socked away. And, um, but that isn't relevant if you haven't owned your property for a long period of time, if the land values haven't increased, or if you're a new, per new home buyer, right? But this, this is good for people who have owned their pr property for a long period of time and it's inflated. And for better or worse, ADUs are only a relevant solution in areas where there is a housing crisis and where land values have necessarily inflated a lot. So it tends to be a relevant solution for financing ADUs. Um, another common way that people pay for a portion of the ADU is uh, using liquid assets, so saving stocks, 401k loans. And then sweat equity. So a lot of homeowners are trying to save out of pocket uh, money in the process of building an ADU out of necessity, they will they will do some of the work themselves, or maybe because they want to. And so it's not it's not very common for a homeowner to do all of the work. And I wouldn't I would say it's ill advised in most cases for a homeowner to do all the work themselves. But it's not uncommon at all for homeowners to do a good a good amount of the labor in the finish finishing stages of development. So all the finish work. And so that can save you know ten thousand, twenty thousand, thirty thousand dollars. The last uh, I live in a basement conversion, garage conversion ADU that I just did, and um, I I GC'd the whole project myself, general contracted the whole project, and then I did probably you know a, a good probably half the labor or a, a quarter of the labor myself. And so I I I, I spent out of pocket seventy five thousand dollars, and I did about twenty five thousand dollars of sweat equity. And so that, uh, when I talk about the cost of things. I'm accounting for sweat equity as well as the out-of-pocket expenses. And, uh, in, and also, in general, I'm talking about the cost of uh, uh, design work, permitting, construction, and sweat equity. So I'm, in, I'm, I'm using all those terms. Oftentimes, when you talk to builders about how much, if you say, how much would it cost for you to build an ADU, they're going to tell you what they would charge you, but they're not accounting for the permit fees and the utility connection fees and the, and the sweat equity that you might want to put in. So. So bear that in mind as you think about the cost of development. Um, the last method that a lot of people use to pay for a portion of ADU construction is family loans and non-secured lines of credit. And I always like, like to give a shout out to family loans. Um, if you have somebody in your life, a mom, a dad, an aunt, an aunt or uncle or friend, um, and they have money that's sitting in, a, in an interest account or a conservative like uh, bond account or a money market account that's earning 2% a year, 
you can offer them much better than that, um, and they can give you a loan for that amount of money. So you can offer them 4%, 6% a year, whatever you want. You can do it as formally or as informally as you want, and you are doing them a service, really. And so I always like to give a shout-out to that option for people because a lot of people do do that for, for ADU development. And oftentimes, because ADUs are being used for, like, in-the-family development for mom to be able to, you know, move into the property to help take care of the kids, these types of arrangements can make a lot of sense. Um, lastly, there's other non-secured lines of credit that are often off offered by local ba banks and credit unions. So if, for example, you have $50,000 in the bank, um, a bank might say, we'll give you $50,000 because we see that you are financially stable. And so we'll give you a $50,000 loan. So that's a, it's called a non-secured line of credit. So homeowners use a patchwork of these different methods to pay for ADU development. Um, right now, and because there really are no better ADU financing options. There are, uh, there's a lot of innovation and experimentation going on nationally, meaning in all around the country in different localities with local banks and credit unions coming up with what are called renovation loan products and other in, uh, kind of innovative products that could potentially be used to develop ADUs based on the future value of the property once the ADU is complete. But as of right now, that's not a very common option. So, um, don't bank on that, no pun intended, um, but but it's possible that there might be a local bank or credit union um, around Portsmouth that might be willing to do a renovation loan. Um, so I'm gonna pause there and take a few Q&A questions specifically about cost or financing. There's a question over there. Hi, thank you. <laughs> I just wanted to ask you a question in two tiers. One is when somebody puts in, they may not do this when they buy a house, to get a structural engineer first? Do they go through the environmental thing and, and the water and all that? And the, and the second part of the question is, I would think that uh, prefab homes would get heavily involved with this. Like there are so many tiny house, houses that they, that they can tailor it to what um, the neighborhood association, I know how much you deal with that. I know in Boston that's a real big deal. And uh, you know, as to how the, you know, the aesthetics and I know form of, of the thing, but I would think it would be a lot less money and a lot tighter type of unit with the prefab. Yeah, it, it, you would think that. Um, it, it's it's actually interesting. There's a lot of com there's a lot of companies that have tried to bust into the ADU market um, without much success. Um, and part of that is because some zoning regulation issues that might come up, like some zoning regulations might say you can't have manufactured homes in residential districts or they have to be a certain size. And so therefore, a manufactured home could not, could not be placed on a residential property. Um, other codes might say like the ADU must visually match the primary house, therefore the manufactured home doesn't match. Um, but even if those issues aren't in place, it, it just it's, it seems as though part of why it's not taking off is because modular prefab ADU construction isn't that much cheaper than um, construction on site, um, which is kind of odd. One would think it's a lot cheaper, but when, you, when it comes down to the manufacturing itself or the construction itself off site, the delivery, and all the on-site work with the uh, utility connections and the foundation that has to be done, it ends up being about the same. And oftentimes homeowners want something customized that works specifically for their property and therefore something off the shelf that is one of these standardized plants isn't really meeting what they're wanting because they are investing so much money in this thing. It's gonna be in their backyard the rest of their life. They're gonna be looking at it every day. They want it to be nice looking. And so those are all the reasons why I speculate perhaps that ADU um, like kind of prefab offsite construction has not taken off. Um, but again, this is one of these areas where there's a lot of innovation happening with certain companies around the country and on the West Coast anyway. So there's a lot of e efforts to, for, to bring down the cost of construction, but nobody has figured it out. And there's been a lot of, a lot of kind of big money that's been big Silicon Valley money that's been, been, been poured into trying to figure that one out and nobody's done it yet. Certainly the um, single family market is kind of off the table for most investors. Do you see in these markets or do you think in the future they're going to say, wait a minute, if I buy this for 
$500,000 and I can put another dwelling on there for 160. Now I got two income properties. Of is that happening? And do you predict that for the future? Yeah. So, so in Portland, there's no owner occupancy requirement. So that could theoretically happen because the rules would theoretically allow for that. But interestingly, it hasn't happened. Um, and I think, um, it could happen, though. There's no reason why it couldn't happen. And I think if the numbers worked out, that could become a phenomena. Um, here, there's owner occupancy requirements, so that wouldn't be possible to do unless you were living on the property. So it's not, it's not, you can't do that within the current regulatory environment throughout most of New Hampshire at this point. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, and, 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 and just getting out the kind of the political impacts of that, um, on the one hand, you could say, oh, that would be terrible if it happened. Because then you would have all this, um, all these uh, rental units be, cre be being created. But anybody who works in affordable housing is say, "Wow, that would be great!" Because all these rental units are being created. So I think there's, you know, it, it, I, but that said, I would say don't let the specter of that theoretical idea dissuade you or encourage you, because it's not hasn't borne out in in reality as being an actual trend yet. Um, and the reason I say that is because in California, this this came up as a big issue that prevented legislation from moving forward because they feared the specter of, of speculative development happening as a result of non-owner non occupancy requirements or lack of owner occupancy requirements. And, and I don't think there's any basis for those fears. Well, the one thing I, I want to counter on that is that you showed stats where there's 3.2 people in a nuclear family in 63, and now it's down to 2.6, yeah. I mean, is it ev eventually you're not going to have a mother or a father or a sibling to take care of and put in that other dwelling? I mean, are we, are we just being short-sighted and thinking that in the future it's going to be that way? Um, so, I mean, I, I think the broader the broader point is that ADUs are providing a home size that fills a huge market demand for which there is no housing stock currently. And so, yes, hopefully there will be more rental stock created for those one and two person households um, in some way, shape, or form. And right now, the only one and two person household size units that are available are in kind of expensive downtown condo units. And that isn't what everybody wants. Some people want to live on a property in a residential zone with a yard. And so there's no way to achieve that goal right now. Um, so hopefully ADUs can help fulfill that that market demand. Any questions? Um, it, in your example of a basement becoming an ADU, what's the difference between turning a single ha family into like a multi-unit versus an ADU? Great question. So ADUs are by definition accessory to it, so they're always smaller than the primary unit, and they're usually subject to a certain size limit. But if theoretically you're in a zone where, let's say you had a 10,000 square foot lot, and you were in a zone that allowed for you to have one unit for every 5,000 square feet, you could either put two housing units on that property, you could subdivide that property, you could create a duplex, those are all different viable ways you could take advantage of the code and use the code, or you could build an accessory dwelling in it. And so it might make perfectly good sense to subdivide that lot, create a new housing unit that isn't subject to the size limits of an ADU. It might make sense to do a duplex, tear down the primary house, build a duplex from scratch, or it might make sense to do an ADU. It all is site dependent and goal specific and situation dependent and it involves thinking through the cost of development and the um, and what the but but really it's, it starts with what the zoning is al allows you to do and that's where you can have a pretty frank discussion with a planner say what am I entitled to do on my property and then you then you go from there and you say okay I, c I can do a duplex or I can do an ADU which one makes the most financial sense well an ADU is only going to cost me fifty thousand bucks because I'm going to do a conversion of this already finished basement space or I could tear it down and spend four hundred thousand dollars to do a duplex which one makes more sense well. Maybe you have no way to afford the duplex, so therefore you go with the ADU. But it, yeah, it, it's all it, those are all the kind of factors that might come into place. I'm gonna move move ahead here because um, I've got about ten minutes left. So, um, so I have a whole in in the book. I lay out kind of a step by step process of going through the permitting, and I'm not gonna go through it here. But um, please refer to like the second chapter in the book because it goes into all the step, steps that go into getting a permit done, part of which involves going 
addressing your question from earlier, go, going to a structural engineer. Um, uh, if you're doing a structure that has two stories, you're generally going to need to use a structural engineer. Um, in Portland uh, and in other jurisdictions around the United States, there's a lot of kind of uh, ADU movement happening, and um, in, in, in response to an affordable rental housing crisis or an affordable housing crisis. Um, so there's a lot of workshops like this that are taking place all over the country, uh, which is great. Um, bringing together people who are practitioners, meaning builders, designers, lenders, realtors, city planners, and homeowners. Um, in Portland, we have a citywide ADU tour that I run, and we run this every year. The next one will be in June, and it's the biggest ADU tour in the country, so p p uh, please come on out for it. Um, we'll be posting it on accessorydwellings.org, which is a website that I'll mention in a moment. Um, this tour has, like, anywhere from 10 to 20 ADUs on it, and, and um, the intent is to allow homeowners to get inside a whole bunch of ADUs, talk to the homeowners who built them, talk to the builders and designers, p make connections, and get inspired. This is one ADU that was on the tour, uh, Craftsman Bungalow style, 800 square foot ADU over a three car garage. On the tour, we have architects explaining the process to the homeowners who are on the tour. This is an example of, the, of an ADU going up in Austin, done by the Austin Alley Flat Initiative, which is kind of an affordable housing group that's looking at ADUs as a solution to affordable housing. There's ADUs are taking off in a big way in California right now because of some um, state legislation that enabled ADUs to take off, much like the legislation in New Hampshire that enabled ADUs to start to be a possibility here in New Hampshire. But the California legislation is kind of nationally recognized as being very assertive. And in fact, it has created a tremendous spike in ADU development. This doesn't look like a typical graph because of the spike here, but this is actually what happened in LA. There was 80, 80, 80, 80, uh, 90 ADUs in, in 2015, 80 ADUs in 2016, and 2000 in 2017. That's the impact that good legislation can have on the development of ADUs. And so that the, the, and, and all this legislation did was eliminate off-street parking requirements and eliminated utility connection fees. That's it. So that just goes to show you in part how significant those off-street parking requirements can be. Um, but that legislation had significant impacts in a number of cities in California, Long Beach, San Jose, San Francisco, San Diego, Oakland, LA. Uh, last week in Portland, we had a tour that had policymakers from Washington, D.C., Charlottesville, and Seattle come down to get a tour of ADUs and learn about all the best practices that go into creating a good ADU program. On that tour, we visited, visited this ADU, which is a ADU that was paid for by a county staff person who's talking there in the middle, built for a homeless per person who is that woman holding the baby. Um, they paid for, the county paid for the ADU to be put on somebody's property, and this homeless person got a place to live. The homeowner will take over ownership of the ADU in five years at a severely discounted rate. That's an innovative kind of government-sponsored program to address homelessness. Um, this is one of these prefab modular ADU companies that um, uh, was I was mentioning before. There's a lot of kind of innovation happening with private developers who are coming up with innovative ways to address the design barriers and um, cost barriers to ADU development. And so in this case, um, this company provides a prefab modular manufactured house ADU, standardized ADU for somebody's pr on somebody's property, he will pay for it up front, but um, and then after 20 years, the homeowner takes owner over ownership of it. Meanwhile, the developer will capture two thirds of the rental income and give one third to the homeowner. So that's another model. I don't know if it'll take off as a successful model or not, but there's a lot of point is there's a lot of innovation happening in the ADU development space right now. Um, Going into Portland regulation history, I just want to dive into this little anecdote for a moment here. In Portland in 2000, up to 1996, um, ADUs were allowed by right. There was no minimum lot size. There was no off-street parking requirement. There was, um, the, it, they could be as big as a house. You could do internal conversion only. Um, and there was owner occupancy requirements. And there was roughly 20, like five to 10 per year being permitted at that time. In 1990, uh, 1998, they loosened up ADU regulations significantly. They said, uh, we are going to allow uh, ADUs citywide. You can rent out both units. There's no owner occupancy requirement. And we are going to even allow detached ADUs. And guess what? 
Did they use takeoff at that point? No. They went up to about 20 per year. And this is about what's happening in the rest of the country right now, where there's like a pittance of ADUs happening, even in this environment where you would think ADUs would be taking off in great abundance because the regulations are so flexible. Um, um, then finally, in 2010, they uh, increased the allowable size of ADUs from 33% uh, from of the size of the primary house to 75% of the primary house, and they waived the impact fees, which are these uh, additional residential impact fees that cost like 10,000 bucks. You don't have them here. Um, and when they waive those fees and, and increase the size cap of ADUs, finally at that point, ADUs finally started to take off, but it took a long time. Uh, so there was a lot of effort putting into, into getting ADUs to take off. And, um, and it went from an average of 22 per year to 615 per year, which is uh, a 22-fold increase in six years. And so Portland now has um, you know, roughly 600 a year being developed, which is awesome. Um, but bear in mind that with 615, or with this number of ADUs, there's a total of 2,000 ADUs on the ground built right now in Portland in a city with 240,000 housing units. So it's, it's like less than 1% of all the housing stock are ADUs. And so I'm, I'm always like, yeah, this is an incredible growth of ADUs, but there's so much more opportunity. Um, and the other point of that story is to say, like, there, you know, there's a l you c the sky is not going to fall, even if you have really good ADU regulations in Portsmouth. Um, and so there's a lot of room for improvement with the regulations. Um, and, uh, and even if you have the best regulations in the world, it's still really hard to get ADUs to take off um, because of all the financial and zoning and design barriers that come along with the development of them. Um, in Portland, they're, they're now looking at allowing for two ADUs on a property following in the footsteps of Vancouver, BC. So, are, so is Seattle. Um, there's a, kind of a prescription to what I believe to be the best path or a pathway for cities to follow to see more ADUs built, and that's covered in chapter like 11 of my book. Um, here are some of the highlight preconditions of an ADU movement. And, um, based on the research that I've done. There has to be an affordable rental housing crisis and high land values, predominance of single family residential zoning. Neither of these are good things, but these are re requisite. There needs to be political leadership. So if you have a city council with nine voting members and five of them like ADUs, that's a good thing. Um, there um, needs to be flexible zoning and development regulations. And I'd say there's room for improvement everywhere in the country on this front. Um, and certainly, certainly throughout the, the entire East Coast, I think there's a lot of room for improvement. Um, and I cover the best practices for zoning regulations in chapter eight, nine, 10 of my book. Um, homeowners are gonna be the developers of ADUs. There needs to be faith in government, um, meaning that the permitting office has to be kind of forthright and uh, transparent with what the regulations are and predictable with how homeowners can interact with them. And lastly, homeowners need to be able to access sufficient capital to pay for these expensive things if they're going to be able to do it, which typically means there needs to be um, increasing home equity due to land value inflation. So those are the preconditions of an ADU movement. Um, this is a website called accessorydwellings.org that I run that's kind of a, um, intended to be a, you know, a, a place where you can find a whole bunch of case studies of ADUs and other best practices for ADU development. This is a website that I uh, have where um, there's a web course and a photo gallery of ADUs and a, and a bunch of blogs, buildingadu.com. And then there's the book, which you all should get if you don't already, because you will never see it at this price ever again. Um, so um, thank you so much. I'm going to wrap it up. And uh, we'll have the city planner come up and answer some of your harder questions. And I, I think the plan is to have the city planner come up, and then um, we're both going to be up here answering some questions collectively afterwards. I had two reasons why I had this book in my hand. One was to say it's an incredibly low price tonight only. <laughs> um, but the second, I wanted to, uh, and think, thinking of the bullet point of political leadership, I wanted to give this book to Senator, Senator Martha Fuller Clark because she's exhibited that kind of leadership. I think the reason why we're having this kind of robust discussion is that we had Senate Bill 146 that was introduced in 2016. And as anyone knows, that process is an arduous process. It takes a lot of strong political leadership and energy. And so we wanted to thank you because we're having this discussion as a result of your leadership 
and, um, and certainly do it, at least want to give you this book in our appreciation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> City planner Juliet Walker. <laughs> um, so actually, I'm I'm more here to answer questions. I can give you a quick overview of what we allow in Portsmouth, and um, our zoning regulation was developed about in we adopted in 2017 in response to the state legislation. Um, but I also want to just mention that um, two of the other city planners are also here. Um, we have lots of staff that can help with people who have questions. Um, Nick Cracknell is here. He's one of our principal planners. But more importantly, Vincent Hayes, who is your go-to guy on accessory dwelling units um, in the planning office. So if you do come in and have a question about accessory dwelling units, whether it's a good fit for your property, you will most likely get referred to Vincent. So if I say anything wrong, Vincent's going to correct me tonight. Um, <coughs> So just quickly an overview, um, because I think probably some of you have specific questions um, that I can answer as well. Um, we have two technical, technically accessory dwelling unit types in Portsmouth. One is detached accessory dwelling units, and one is ex uh, attached accessory dwelling units. Um, and then we also have something called a garden cottage. So the attached accessory dwelling units are um, what Cole already described, which is a conversion within your existing home, or you could potentially add on an addition um, for an accessory dwelling unit. And then uh, detached are what that says is that if you build a, a separate uh, structure in your the back of your property or somewhere on your property um, that is um, an accessory dwelling unit. And then a garden cottage is actually a conversion of an existing structure on your property. Um, so for example, uh, a garage or a shed. Um, and that, uh, that is also allowed. Um, we don't call it an accessory dwelling unit. Um, and I can get into the reasons for that, but that is technically from um, what Cole described, also an accessory dwelling unit. Um, we have a maximum, so the process is um, you apply for a conditional use permit through the planning board. Um, and the reason that is, is when we initially developed the zoning regulations for accessory dwelling units, um, <coughs> there was initially some, a little bit of concern um, that we didn't want to be overwhelmed by accessory dwelling units without having an understanding of um, whether we'd right size this, the zoning regulations for the community. Um, and we wanted to have a process through which the planning board could give, could see the applications, um, have some criteria that each application had to meet. Um, but the other thing, more importantly, is the conditional use permit process also allows the planning board to make modifications to some of the dimensional requirements. So an attached and detached accessory dwelling unit has a maximum size of 750 square feet gross floor area, but the planning board may change that based on um, the, the condition of what is being presented to them from the, that applicant. Similarly, the um, garden cottage has a maximum of 600 square feet, but that can also be modified by the planning board. So rather than having to go yo-yo back and forth between a variance for the zoning board of adjustment, which grants variances to our dimensional regulations, you actually can work with the planning board um, to potentially modify some of these requirements. Um, and yes, we have done both um, allow for greater uh, square footage and also stuck to the limit. So there's probably some people in this room who've had experience with having to comply with that maximum um, and, and as Cole described, sort of figure out a way to make a, a room a little smaller and maybe have some extra storage or something as compared to the living area. So that is something we are working through. The other thing is we do have an owner occupancy requirement, so we aren't as flexible as Portland. I, we're not nearly as flexible as Portland right now. Um, so that is something that um, we need one of the units to be occupied by the owner of the property, um, and that is a stipulation. Um, the yes, for every for all three of those. Um, the other thing is we do something called a certificate of use, which um, once you've gone through the permitting process, you've received your building permit from the inspection department, you have a certificate of occupancy. Um, the Vincent Hayes will visit your property. He'll certify that or he'll make sure that you meet all the requirements or we'll, we'll ask you for information to, to make sure you still are the owner of the property, so forth. And we just issue a certificate of use and that gets renewed annually. And again, that's because we wanna make sure these accessory dwelling units are, are staying consistent with what their original approval was. Um, that's something that in the planning office, we haven't actually issued a renewal yet on any of our, of our um, 
accessory dwelling units. Um, we're going to see how that goes. We're, we don't want that to be a barrier to accessory dwelling units, but we do have to have a way to track it and make sure that um, because of that owner occupancy requirement, other things that, that those ADUs are being um, complied with um, in the long term. Um, I can't really talk about the uh, building code requirements. I think that's um, something that some other people in the room might have more experience with in Portsmouth. Um, I, don't, I don't myself apply the life safety code to the um, ADUs, but I know that ADUs have to work through that with the building department, and there may be some learning curves for us as a city as to what requirements are appropriate for ADUs, and maybe we can look at other cities um, to determine that. I don't, again, the building inspector isn't here tonight, so I can't speak for him, um, but if there are concerns about that, maybe we can have a, another conversation or raise that with, uh, with the, within the city um, related to what we have the ability to do. So I don't, it, parking is also, um, parking is the same as any other single family, so it's based on the size of the unit. <coughs> We recently changed our parking requirements. Um, we used to have just one standard two parking spaces for every single family. Now we have it based on the size of the unit. So it could be as low as 0.5. It could be as high as 1.5 or something like that. So um, depending on, usually for most ADUs situations, it's going to be two parking spaces required for the lot. Um, okay. So I guess I would just say that maybe if Cole wants to come up, we could answer questions together. Or so if you raise your hand, I'll just touch, let me just touch on one uh, sure. thing that um, Julia, I'm sorry, Julia alluded to, which is typically, so the planning and zoning code for ADUs is different than the planning and zoning code for detached new single family construction. Typically, the building code is not. So one of the points I like to make for homeowners is um, the design of ADUs is different, but the building of ADUs is not. So you, any builder who can build, build a single family house can build an ADU. The only thing that differentiates ADU f in terms of the building code typically is is the utility connections, which are a little bit different. And that's where cities have to work out the kinks as the program starts to take off. So uh, Martha Fleur Clark, I have a question which is related to short term rentals. And if you're seeing that ADUs are being built and then being used for short-term rentals, like Airbnb, and how can that, what about the interface, and have we seen that as a issue um, elsewhere um, in the country? So I'd love to hear Cole's uh, perspective on this. Right now, um, we, I think that's more a question about how we regulate short-term rentals in the city, because um, uh, First of all, so an ADU could not be used as a short-term rental because a short-term rental would have to be a business, and we don't allow ADUs to be used as a business. So that's the short answer. Um, the bigger answer is, um, which I think we're going to be getting to shortly in the city, is a discussion about how we define short-term rentals and how that's applied more broadly in the city. Um, so that may, the, the result may be that in the future we do allow accessory dwelling units to be used for short-term rentals. I don't know what the outcome of that is going to be. I think it's going to be a complicated and exhausting discussion, but a good one. Um, but I do think that, um, just to, in short, um, because right now we classify short-term rentals as a business, um, we would not technically allow that. So I don't know, for example, right now how many illegal ADUs are being used as short-term rentals. Because there are, I'm sure there are, um, I shouldn't say legal. It, it is illegal, but I'm sure there are an informal, thank you. I'm sure there are informal ADUs out there that have not gone through the permitting process, and I'm sure that many of them are being used for short-term rentals. Um, and I'll, I'll just chime in, uh, just say that uh, this is like the number one question that's coming up everywhere in the country. We don't want um, ADUs because ADUs means there will be more short-term rentals. And I think um, what Juliet has expressed here, uh, or what I understand to be the case, is that you can't do short-term rentals within residential zones in general, and therefore you can't do ADU, you can't do short-term rentals in ADUs. And that, to me, is a fair thing. I think that I think the the from, as a general matter, to decouple the short-term rental regulation from the AD regulation is a good idea. In other words, if you allow short-term rentals in re residential zones, then you should consider allowing them in ADUs. If you don't allow them in, in residential zones, then they shouldn't be allowed in ADUs. Totally fair. Um, so there's a lot more to this question to unpack. If you want to go deeper into it, I'm happy to do so offline. Uh, but I'll just leave it at that. Can, can I ask you a question? When you say an existing unit, uh, like let's say you bought a house, 
And then you, you had another edifice and you used it for a purpose. It was personal use, but not for rental. I mean, does it have to be existing when you buy the house? Or is it, because sometimes people may add on something for another reason, then they decide to put it to an ADU, convert it to an ADU? I mean, define existing. Is it existing when you buy it? Or yes. The, uh, so what I was referring to for garden cottages, and, and I, this is an, an, a, a detached structure, not something that's like an addition. So if, if it existed when we adopted the ordinance, which was January of 2017. Yes, I, um, I'm confused because I, I came here because I thought this was about uh, building an accessory dwelling unit on a piece of property in pretty much anywhere in this state as defined by the statute. And it says, defines accessory dwelling units as residential living units that are within or attached to a single family dwelling and provide independent living facilities for one or more people. My question to Juliet, is it? Yep. Juliet, is you said that in Portsmouth, this must be owner occupied. And my question is, if my wife here and I are not getting along. Am I going to ship her to the ADU and ask her to pay me a thousand bucks a month? One of one of the units has to be owner occupied, not both. That doesn't make any sense because what? it's not like that. It could be both. You could have both owner occupied. Yeah. Uh, I, one or the other on the property well has I'm to be owner occupied. We're living in the house, okay, and the other unit has to be owner occupied. No, I just said one or the other has to be owner occupied. Okay. Yeah. All right. Because it's not like that in other towns. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah. That. So we we're very specific. It could be, and you know, Cole, I think is an example of someone who built an ADU and actually lived in it, and then he didn't have to meet that owner occupancy requirement in Portland. But um, in Portsmouth, we require that one of the units, whether it's the accessory dwelling unit or the principal dwelling unit, be occupied by the owner, by the owner of the property. I'm not going to get into that detail because it's something we're struggling with. The question is whether the corporation owns, owns the property. Um, we, ha we have dealt with that already uh, at the planning board level, and we are working on better refining our ordinance to define that. But we, we really are <clears throat> trying to interpret it so that it's a, an individual is the owner, not a corporation or LLC. Yeah, I have two questions, one for Juliet, one for Cole. But on Juliet, as far as um, retiring in place, one of the things would be to you know, keep your costs down and maybe pay your property taxes. How will uh, an addition of an ADU affect property taxes? Is it based on revenue or construction I, costs? Or I cannot answer that question. Yeah. I, that's really an assessor question, and I really could not speak. Yeah. Um, Do you anticipate that expertly. that's going to be a, a, a financial consideration here? Because I know it's a good question, but I, I don't really know the answer. P probably other people in the community. I mean, Cole, Cole already addressed this. So, so in general, yes, you are. In, anytime you do any permitted work, that that through the city, right? Um, then the count causes the county to do a reassessment of the improved value of your property, the structure imp structural improvement value. Yeah. And so, yes, your taxes will go up yeah. to some extent. But to get into the specifics of how much your taxes will go up. You'd have to talk to yeah. the assessor. I, I guess the question was, was it related to revenue or just It's not revenue. Okay. It's going to be based okay. on the structural and, improvement. And Cole, and just from your perspective, uh, what I, I assume you're, you've read or you've become a little familiarized with Portsmouth. What do you see as impediments? What, are, what, what things would you like to see the city change maybe that make – because you mentioned here about – how things didn't take off in uh, yeah. Portland. So uh, if you could name one or two things which you think maybe uh, based on time, maybe the more experience that they'll learn that, that you think that should be changed. So it's pretty evident to me that um, there's, 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 ex there's an ex exorbitant number of barriers to development. The first set of barriers that need to, be, that need to come down are regulatory barriers. Even, even after that, they still won't take off because the financing is still a barrier. Even if financing is addressed, then it's still really hard to go through the development process. So it is a really challenging thing to get ADUs to take off. From a regulatory point of view, um, the more flexible the regulations are, the better. And that comes down to really picking in things like setback requirements. But it also, bigger picture, I think the, the biggest barriers in for, for a variety of reasons that I address in my book are off-street parking requirements and owner occupancy requirements. Um, so around here, there isn't any examples of cities that don't have owner occupancy requirements for ADUs. But I will say as a general matter, what other housing forms in the United States 
have an owner occupancy requirement? The answer is none. There is no other housing form in the United States where there is an owner occupancy requirement. Not for duplexes, not for single family houses, not for multifamily apartments. So why do we feel as though ADUs must be relegated and treated in such a way that they're systematically, economically undermined by having this, 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 this um, very, I would say, indefensible provision put upon them. So that's my perspective. Obviously, I'm a big fan of ADUs and not a big fan of owner occupancy requirements, uh, but I realize that that is the rule of the land in general. Um, so please read the book if you want to know more about the thinking behind that, but it has to do really with financing ADUs. Hi, Juliet. I'm wondering if there are any additional HDC requirements if you live in that area. Uh, if you're making any exterior, it, there wouldn't be any additional. So if you're living, if you live in an H, in the historic district and you are making exterior changes, you would be subject to the same requirements as um, as any other property in the HDC. So we don't add any additional requirements. Um, we do have, and Cole alluded to this, that it's pretty uh, consistent in other places to have some architecturally consistent requirements, but they're pretty general. Um, it's sort of, you know, the I think the wording is something to the effect of the ADU shall be architecturally similar or, um, you know, reflect the character of the, both the principal uh, structure as well as the neighborhood in general. So, but it's not, it doesn't go to the HDC if it's not in the HDC. All right, thank you so much, Cole and Juliet. So that's all the time that we have for tonight, but Cole is here for another couple of days in New Hampshire, so he'll be in Concord tomorrow with Plan New Hampshire, and he'll be at New Hampshire Housing's Housing in the Economy Conference on Thursday in Manchester, so you'll have more opportunities to talk to him. You also, of course, will remind you again, can purchase the book and read this, and that's pretty much just as good as talking to Cole, right? Um, so I just want to say thank you to New Hampshire Housing presenting this event and PS21, our um, co-host tonight. It has been, this is the first time that the Workforce Housing Coalition has gotten a chance to collaborate on an event with PS21, and it was great, and I'd like to do it again. Um, <laughs> I'd also like to just thank all of our sponsors again. So our leading sponsor is AARP. They're the reason that you're getting this book at a 60% discount tonight. Um, and I'd also like to thank our other sponsors, the Sailmakers House, Ambit Engineering, Riverwoods Durham, and our event partners, Seacoast Media Group, PortsmouthNewHampshire.com, 3S Art Space, of course, and Corahoo Film Institute. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Thank you.